Hi students today we are going to talk about matter in this chapter what is matter matter is all around you look at this computer here this computer is matter if you go out in any garden the rose you see is matter the house you live in it is matter the entire earth itself is matter the clouds that bring rainfall are matter and the rain that falls is also matter in this chapter we are going to understand exactly what matter consists of we are going to study the physical nature of matter understood so let's proceed and let's try to understand exactly what matter is made up of and other such things let's proceed the physical nature of matter first of all what is matter matter is anything that has mass and occupies space look at the books or keyboard or table or room around you all of them have some mass isn't it and all of them occupy some space there is no doubt about it that is the reason everything that you see around you is matter understood anything that has mass and occupies space that is it has volume is basically matter look at this room here you can see some chairs you can see computers you can see files and folders all of them have mass and all of them occupy space so all of them are matter now there's one interesting question here what about air and gases are they matter too let's conduct an experiment and check if air and other gases are matter too to conduct this experiment let's take a bicycle pump now let's attach this bicycle pump to a balloon that's not inflated you know a small balloon like this now let's try to fill air inside the balloon here we go we are filling air inside this red balloon as you can see after we filled air inside the balloon the balloon has now become inflated it occupies much more space you know compared to the space it was occupying earlier now what is this thing inside the balloon that has increased the space the balloon occupies it is air and this tells us that air occupies space so definitely air fulfills at least one condition of matter air occupies space but does air have mass again let's conduct another experiment to check this here let's weigh this flaccid football a football with no air in it as you can see it weighs 0.400 kg here we go so with no air in it this football weighs 0.4 kg isn't it Now let's use the same bicycle pump that we used earlier to fill air in the balloon. Let's use that bicycle pump to fill air in this football. When we do that and when we weigh the football, we see that the weight of the football has now become 0.402 kg. Where has that extra weight come from? Of course, it has come from the air inside the football, isn't it? Because without the air, the football weighed less, but with the air, the football now weighs more. and that tells us that air has mass and therefore since air has mass and it occupies space air is matter too similarly not just air all gases are matter too anything in general that you can touch feel you know anything that occupies space is generally matter now that we've learned the basics of matter the second question pops up what does matter exactly consist of matter is made up of particles you see what this means is that the table in front of you your computer your t-shirt the room around you is all made up of small particles all of this seems like a continuous mass if you look at a table it seems like the table is one huge block isn't it however even that table consists of small particles in fact all matter on this earth consists of small particles we can actually see this for ourselves by conducting a small experiment shall we conduct the experiment here we go let us take some pure water in a beaker here we go this is the water now let us add some common salt to this water here we are sprinkling some common salt over the water when we add this salt to water the salt instantly settles down in the water it doesn't immediately dissolve in the water especially you know if you've added a lot of salt now let's take a glass rod and let's stir this water so that the salt dissolves 
After some time as you can see, the salt dissolves and the water becomes clear just as before. So what you can see is that there is no change in the level of water and you cannot see the salt. It's neither you know below the water nor on the top of the water surface. But there is no salt. The salt has disappeared. How has the salt disappeared? This can be explained only if you consider the fact that matter consists of particles. If you say that matter consists of particles, then you can say that the water consists of water particles and the salt consists of salt particles. When you add the salt particles to the water particles, they occupy the empty spaces between the water particles, understood? And when you stir with the glass rod, the salt particles actually fit inside those empty spaces between the water particles. And that is the reason, you know, the salt dissolves inside the water. It does not settle over the water or below the water, understood? So that is the explanation of why salt dissolves in water. What this tells us is that both salt and water consist of particles. You know, the water particles are constantly moving and the salt particles get inside those water particles when you dissolve salt in water. And that tells us that matter is made up of particles. Now, you know, sometimes it may sound weird that things which are generally not particulate in general to the human eye, even they are made up of particles. If you look at your textbook, if you look at your water bottle, you'll see that all these things don't look like particles. Like you can pick up your water bottle and you can put down your water bottle. Where are the particles? But the particles are there. They are tightly bound in case of solids. You know, which is why you cannot sometimes distinguish between the particles. But everything consists of particles. When a liquid flows, it's the particles which are flowing. When a gas, you know, spreads in a room, it's the particles which are spreading in the room. Interesting, but this is true. You can in fact consider matter to be similar to a pomegranate. Here's a pomegranate in front of you on your screen. A pomegranate, you know, appears to be a rigid mass, but it actually consists of a lot of seeds, isn't it? Here are the pomegranate seeds. The point here is that all matter, though it seems to consist of a rigid mass, similarly consists of a lot of particles. Understood? Just like a pomegranate contains a lot of seeds, Matter contains a lot of small particles. So that was the pomegranate analogy. Now, we've just learned that matter consists of particles. But how small are these particles? Or are they big particles? Again, we can conduct an experiment to find out how big or small the particles of matter are. In this experiment, let us first take 100 milliliters of water. Pure water like this. Now let us add 1 gram of potassium permanganate to this water. The quality of potassium permanganate is that you know potassium permanganate solution is pink in color. Something like this. So when you add potassium permanganate, the solution immediately turns pink. Now let's do something interesting. Let's take 10 milliliters of this potassium permanganate solution and let's add it to 100 ml of pure water. Here we go. When we do that, that 100 ml of pure water also turns pink. But this time the pink is not as bright as the initial pink. Understood? This is because since we've taken 10 ml of the initial potassium permanganate solution, only one tenth of the initial potassium permanganate is present in this new diluted potassium permanganate solution. Now, let us take 10 milliliters of this new diluted potassium permanganate solution and let us add it to 100 ml of pure water again. Now, when we do that, again, this new water solution also turns pink. But again, this pink is slightly dull because this contains very less amount of potassium permanganate, isn't it? After all, we took one tenth of the initial potassium permanganate and added it to the second beaker. Now we're taking one tenth of one tenth of this potassium permanganate and adding it to this third beaker. So you can say that approximately one hundredth portion of the initial potassium permanganate is present in the third beaker. But still, the third beaker water also turns pink. Now, let us take one tenth of this potassium permanganate solution you know, around 10 ml of this potassium permanganate solution and let's add it to this beaker of pure water. What do we see? We see that this beaker of pure water also turns pink, though this time the pink is very, very light. 
this is again because this small portion that we've taken you know that 10 ml of very very diluted potassium permanganate solution that also contains some particles of potassium permanganate after all that is why this water turns pink now let's again take 10 ml of this extremely diluted potassium permanganate solution and let's add it to another beaker of pure water interestingly this beaker of pure water also turns lightish pink and that tells us that even though there's only a very tiny amount of potassium permanganate present in this water still the qualities of potassium permanganate are being exhibited here you see initially we took one gram then we took one tenth of that one gram then one tenth of that one tenth of that so maybe one by ten thousandth or maybe one by one lakh portion of the initial one gram of potassium permanganate is present in this water and still it shows pink color that tells us that you know even that small quantity of potassium permanganate must also have a lot of particles of potassium permanganate because these particles are actually spreading throughout the water and causing the pink color isn't it if there were just one or two particles of potassium permanganate left they wouldn't have caused you know the entire solution of water to turn pink for the entire solution of water to turn pink a lot of particles you know must distribute themselves throughout the water what this tells us is that the particles of matter are very very tiny they are extremely small in size after all you know one by ten thousandth or even lesser portion of the initial portion of potassium permanganate that we took has so many thousands of particles isn't it and therefore that's our conclusion millions of particles of potassium permanganate are present in one gram of potassium permanganate and that tells us that the size of matter particles in general is extremely small so you must remember this all matter particles even if they are particles of the table near you the particles of the chair you are sitting on the particles of water the particles of sugar salt potassium permanganate all of them are extremely small in size that is what this experiment tells us to further clear our concepts related to how small the particles of matter are and the fact that matter consists of particles, let's consider a small example. Here's the question. We just proved that potassium permanganate consists of small particles. How can you similarly prove that the Dettol solution we commonly use in our homes also consists of small particles? Hmm. This question is definitely a thinking question. Can you guess how we can prove that the tall consists of small particles? Well, it's easy. Let's take a bottle of Dettol and let's add 10 milliliters of Dettol to pure water like this. When we do so, immediately, you know, that water solution gives that typical Dettol smell. As you can see, this man here, this cartoon, he can smell the Dettol solution. Now, Let's take 10 milliliters of this Dettol solution and let's add it to a large quantity of pure water. When we do that, again, Dettol vapors still come out of that water and we can still smell Dettol in that dilute Dettol solution. If you take 10 ml of this dilute Dettol solution and if you add that to pure water again, again, the smell of Dettol is still there. Can you see that? That tells us that even though you you know keep on diluting the Dettol solution initially we added 10 ml of Dettol to a beaker of water then we took just 10 ml of that solution and added it to a beaker of pure water then we took 10 ml of just that dilute solution and added it to you know a beaker full of water even when we repeat this process many times even extremely diluted Dettol solution gives that typical Dettol smell what that tells us is that a very very tiny quantity of Dettol also gives us that Dettol smell and that happens because the particles of Dettol they you know escape from the water and they reach our noses that's why we get that Dettol smell and definitely if a very dilute solution of Dettol is also giving the Dettol smell that tells us that even a very tiny quantity of Dettol has a large number of Dettol particles in it that is why those Dettol particles are still reaching our nose and giving us the Dettol smell so this proves that Dettol also consists of extremely tiny particles. So did you understand, you know, what we've studied so far in this chapter? 
we've basically studied two important things. We've studied that matter, all matter, consists of particles. The second point we've studied is that matter consists of extremely small particles such that you know even a small quantity of matter contains millions and millions of matter particles. These are the two concepts that we've studied in this chapter. And that brings us to the end of this small chapter related to the physical nature of matter. Let's now proceed to the next chapter.